Well, good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome you to this uh, webinar. Uh, we are uh, together uh, producing this uh, webinar, uh, Alianza Americas, Sierra Club, and the Labor Council for Latin Americans Advancement. Uh, the topic, as you know, is to explore uh, NAFTA and its implications, particularly in the context of other issues that are very relevant to the North America continent, the rest of the hemisphere, and of course the world, critical issues such as uh, climate change. Um, my name again is Oscar Chacon, and I'm the Executive Director of Alianza Americas, and I will be moderating this call. We will be providing you with detailed biographic information for each of the panelists that are going to be uh, with us this afternoon. I will very briefly uh, mention them, uh, just so that you know who they are. Uh, the first one to get us going is going to be Ben uh, Bici, and Ben is uh, now with the uh, Sierra Club, but he has had uh, quite a few years uh, of involvement and leadership on the issues that we are going to be talking today. Uh, following Ben, we will hear from Cristina, uh, who is Cristina Garcia is actually one of my colleagues at Alianza Americas. Uh, she will also be presenting the perspective of Alianza America on the topic. And uh, last but not least, Hector Sanchez, the Executive Director of the Labor Council of Latin Americans Advancement, the current chair of the National Hispanic Leadership Agenda, a very broad coalition of Latino-led uh, organizations in the country doing policy advocacy work. Um, it is obviously a topic of great uh, uh, critical moment because recently the renegotiation has begun formally into trying to figure out how in, and in what way should uh, the North America Free Trade Agreement be changed. Uh, this is the very reason why we felt that this particular uh, conversation was so important. And again, I mean, we are going to try to be swift in the presentations we are intending to have each presenter present to you for about 15 minutes so that we have an opportunity to uh, actually get most of your questions uh, let me remind you that we are not going to be opening up mics uh, at all the way it works in this particular format is you submit your questions using the uh, platform that we are using for this webinar that is one of my one, one other colleague of mine will be actually paying attention to the questions as they come in and will be helping us uh, actually address uh, the questions that you send us uh, via that particular mechanism so without further ado let me actually welcome ben bici who as i already said is actually with the sierra club and we are uh, happy to have ben uh, get the first uh, uh, slot in terms of presenter's time. And I'd like to welcome you, Ben, and please uh, go on. You are the first speaker in this presentation. Thank you, Oscar. Um, I'm now gonna turn off my video, just say hello, and I will share some slides. Um, one second. All right. Can you see my slides? Not yet, Ben. Okay. Usually it takes a few seconds to come up. Okay, how about now? Can you see the slides? Yes. Great. So uh, thank you, Oscar. Um, you know, so my name is Ben again, and I work with the Sierra Club. Um, so why why does the Sierra Club care about trade? Uh, I, I direct our trade program here. We're um, you know fighting climate change. We're fighting environmental injustice. All of us are fighting many fights right now. Um, why would we choose to work on trade? Um, you know, the short answer is that uh, we didn't choose to work on trade. Uh, trade chose to work on us. Um, we started seeing, uh, starting a couple decades ago, how uh, trade deals uh, started moving away from what most of us think of as trade uh, and started moving towards uh, a binding set of rules that had less to do with trade 
uh, and were more about uh, setting uh, rules that uh, said what our economies and our governments could and could not do. Um, and so it begs the question, really, of who is writing the rules that are in these trade deals? Uh, also got to mention that the you know NAFTA renegotiations started last week uh, with talks starting uh, in secret, um, and so you know it's important to say who is who is helping to advise these talks. Well, there's actually uh, about 500 uh, corporate advisors. 500 advisors, most of them, about 85 percent of them, explicitly represent corporations, um, and they have privileged access to secret negotiating texts. They're the ones who get to give advice on these rules. Uh, let's take a look at, for example. Uh, the people who are writing the rules um, for the TPP, a past trade deal, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, these are the folks that you can see on the screen right now that were in the room uh, getting to give advice on what the TPP should say about energy, which of course has a lot of climate and environmental impacts. So we have here Halliburton, uh, one of the pioneers of fracking, was getting to help write these rules. Um, we have the National Mining Association representing big coal. We have Chevron. Um, clearly, the fossil fuel corporations are well represented in the writing of our trade deals. Uh, Sierra Club was not in this room. Uh, you know, Alianza Americas was not in this room. Uh, La Club was not in this room. Um, and so, if these are the people who are helping to write these rules uh, under the guise of free trade, uh, it maybe is, should come as not a big surprise that we end up with trade deals that are essentially a grab bag of corporate handouts. And that's what NAFTA is. It's a grab bag of corporate handouts. Um, we've seen this deal in effect now for over two decades, so we don't have to uh, dwell in hypotheticals. We can talk about the very specific impacts it's had on our daily lives. I'm gonna uh, talk about particularly three different kinds of corporate handouts that we see in NAFTA and some of the impacts that, we've, we've, that have resulted. The first one is a corporate uh, protection number one is that NAFTA and trade deals like NAFTA allow corporations, but not people, to cross borders. Again, NAFTA allows corporations, but not people, to cross borders. You know, the, the explicit purpose of these trade deals is to allow corporations to go to whatever country um, is the lowest cost of doing business for them. Well, if you're in the U.S. and under NAFTA you're considering going to Mexico, what are some ways that you can cut down on costs? Clearly. Wages is one of those ways. Um, in the United States, the average manufacturing wage is $21 an hour, and the average manufacturing wage in Mexico, $2 an hour. You might save a buck if you offshore jobs and production to Mexico. What about environmental protections? It turns out that Mexico inspects its border factories less than half as often as in the United States, uh, which means that if you're a U.S. corporation, thinking about moving to Mexico, uh, wanting to not have to follow our environmental rules protecting our air, our water, and climate, you have a, a twice a good, as good a chance of uh, evading those policies, uh, not complying with them, and not getting caught if you go to Mexico. So, you know, what has this actually meant? Um, it's been essentially NAFTA a lot by allowing corporations to cross the borders in continual search of lowest wages and weak labor and environmental standards has incentivized this race to the bottom whereby corporations offshore jobs and pollution. What has that actually meant for our communities? Um, I'm going to give you one example. Um, it has to do with lead pollution. So, you know, uh, it, the science shows we're all, I think, aware that no level of lead is safe, particularly for infants and babies. Um, and so groups like the Sierra Club and many others have been fighting for years for increased protections against lead contamination in our air and water. Um, and in 2009, we scored a victory. We got new uh, lead protections uh, in the United States saying that uh, to limit uh, air pollution, uh, pollution of our air with, with lead. And... Um, the thing is that prior to this, prior to that 2009 policy, there were these uh, corporations in the United States producing lead acid batteries. These are the batteries that are in your car. Uh, and they would recycle these batteries once, they're, once you're done with them, once uh, your car battery is worn out. And those batteries would be recycled in factories in the United States. Um, so they were sent to the U.S. factories to get recycled into scrap metal. Well, after we succeeded in getting a new protection against lead contamination in the United States, it became more expensive to, uh, to recycle lead acid batteries in the United States because they had to make sure they weren't contaminating the air with lead. So what did they do instead? 
These corporations instead decided to start exporting their lead acid batteries to Mexico, taking advantage of the fact that NAFTA allowed uh, corporations to export their batteries to Mexico free of charge, uh, and taking advantage of the fact that in Mexico, protections against lead contamination are 10 times weaker than in the US. So they sent them to places like the city of Monterrey in northern Mexico and sent them to factories there to be recycled there under very weak protections against lead contamination. And so you might guess what happened next. A group of academics said, I wonder if there are any uh, uh, effects on the health or the environment in northern Mexico as a result. And they went down and they studied uh, and found that babies living near these factories that are now recycling lead acid batteries from the U.S., uh, were being born at increasing um, uh, rates of being underweight, increasing rates of, of health effects um, from lead contamination. So this is, you know, the impacts of NAFTA are often discussed in kind of like broad, grandiose terms. This is not hypothetical. Children are literally being born right now in northern Mexico with elevated levels of lead in their blood because of the race to the bottom that NAFTA helped enable. And so... I'm gonna pause here because I think it's really important to emphasize this point. Who won in this scenario? The way that Trump talks about trade and NAFTA in particular is that you know, trade deals are all about the US versus Mexico. Well, who won, the US or Mexico? I mean, in the US, so we had all these uh, uh, lead protections that we finally were able to get in past protecting our communities from lead contamination. That sounds like a win, but as a result of that, we lost jobs because the factories that were recycling those batteries went to Mexico. So maybe Mexico won. It got the jobs. But at what cost? At the cost of children being born with elevated levels of lead in their blood. Who won here? The only ones who won in this scenario really were the corporations. And that is the essential fallacy uh, of Trump's xenophobic uh, frame around trade, of what these trade deals mean. Uh, NAFTA and other trade deals are not about the U.S. versus the rest of the world. They're about corporations versus the rest of us. So what should we do to replace NAFTA? We need a solid floor of labor and environmental protections. Um, if corporations can go from across borders uh, to take production from one country to another, we need to make sure there are equivalent levels of labor and environmental protections on both sides of the borders. That means, uh, for example, uh, requiring countries to implement important international labor and environmental agreements, uh, like labor conventions of the International Labor Organization and the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, well, what is Trump planning to do uh, if Trump is renegotiating NAFTA? Um, clearly, he's not thinking about incorporating the Paris Climate Agreement, which he pulled out of. Um, what is he thinking? We just got a glimpse um, when they revealed negotiating objectives for NAFTA. And with regard to labor and the environment, it looks a lot like the TPP, a deal that Trump himself claimed to hate. So just eight months after claiming credit for the death of the TPP, Trump now appears to want to copy and paste provisions from the TPP into NAFTA 2.0. Uh, it just, it, the pro one problem is that most every le leading labor and environmental organization across the United States and uh, many other TPP countries rejected the TPP because those labor and environmental provisions were far too weak. This is not a solid floor of protection. This continue, would continue the race to the bottom. Uh, and if Trump intends NAFTA 2.0, to be an attempt to revive the TPP, he'll face a fight just as broad and vigorous as the one that killed the TPP in the first place. The second handout that I want to mention is that corporations under NAFTA not only can evade our protections by taking their production elsewhere, they can straight up sue our governments over those protections uh, in unaccountable trade tribunals. Um, some of you have heard of the system. It goes by a wonky name called Investor State Dispute Settlement. Basically, the way it works is this. NAFTA gives broad rights to corporations um, uh, that go beyond the rights that are given under domestic U.S. law and says that if an environmental policy or a health protection or a worker protection uh, goes against those rights, the corporation can sue our governments, not in domestic courts, but in these trade tribunals where there are no judges and instead, there are corporate lawyers. These corporate lawyers get to 
order governments to pay millions or hundreds of millions or in some cases even billions of dollars uh, to the corporations uh, for the crime of having enacted policies um, that ostensibly uh, restrict uh, their profits. And so we again don't have to deal with hypotheticals here. Um, we have seen time and again how NAFTA has allowed corporations to bring these cases against our, our hard-fought protections. Many of us fought against the Keystone XL pipeline from indigenous communities in Canada to landowners in Nebraska to black and brown communities in Texas. Uh, we fought against it, we won, and then what did the company do? TransCanada, the company that wanted to build the pipeline, two months later, after the rejection, they went to a NAFTA tribunal and said, we're going to sue you for $15 billion for daring to say no to our pipeline, uh, not in a court, but in a tribunal of corporate lawyers. And they held that threat out there until the day, the very day, that the Trump administration decided to reverse course and greenlight the pipeline. Uh, in other cases, the corporations have, have won. Uh, corporations sued Mexico under NAFTA in one of these tribunals for daring to say no to a toxic waste facility and won. Corporations sued Canada in one of these NAFTA tribunals for daring to say no to a, a quarry mine rejected by the local community and won. So time and again, we have seen how this is just an emblem of the corporate power uh, that, that uh, results from uh, trade deals like NAFTA. The solution is simply to eliminate this uh, rather extraordinary system of corporate tribunals, and corporations can use domestic courts, just like everyone else. What is Trump going to do? Uh, we don't know. Uh, his plan so far has kept it secret. They have not revealed yet um, which way they're going to go on this. And to conclude, I want to uh, just spend a little time on the last major handout uh, that corporations get. Uh, under trade deals like NAFTA, and that is that they're unable to sell and produce and trade more of everything, even things that harm our communities. As an example, NAFTA said, uh, it required actually, that Canada re uh, export a certain quantity of petroleum products, including tar sands oil to the United States. Tar sands oil is one of the most climate polluting, if not the most climate polluting fuel source in, in the world. Um, and so it makes it very difficult for people in Canada to decrease production of tar sands oil um, if NAFTA locks it into place, and that's what NAFTA does. It makes it hard for those of us in the United States who are fighting tar sands oil pipelines like Keystone XL or the Dakota Access Pipeline if NAFTA guarantees a flow of polluting oil through those pipelines. Beyond oil, there are other products, and I think uh, other speakers will be getting into the impacts that corn, for example, has had on, on, on Mexico under NAFTA. Um, NAFTA not only said that uh, we should have uh, you know, a con increased production of tar sands oil, but that U.S. corporations, highly subsidized agribusinesses, should be able to flood Mexico with corn, which essentially put into competition small-scale farmers in Mexico, large-scale subsidized agribusinesses in, in the U.S. The result was predictable, and as uh, we'll go into more, uh, two million people lost their livelihoods uh, because NAFTA allows corporations, but not people, to cross borders, many of those people uh, had to migrate to the United States, and many of them uh, migrated without documents. Uh, migration from Mexico to the United States actually doubled in the first seven years uh, of NAFTA. Um, and so again, this just really points out uh, the hypocrisy uh, in, embodied in the model uh, of NAFTA that gives handouts to corporations, but not people. Um, a lot of the people I should mention that um, are living in, as undocumented immigrants in the United States are some of the most exposed um, to air and water pollution in the United States, including lead pollution. Just to bring it full circle, uh, a lot of the communities in the United States who have to endure lead pollution today are undocumented immigrants, some of whom were displaced by deals like NAFTA. So what should, uh, so what do we need to do? We need to be trading more in goods that support our communities, not ones that pollute and displace us. Unfortunately, the Trump administration is intending to go in precisely the opposite direction. Uh, we've seen proposals from the Trump administration uh, for provisions that would mean more oil and gas pipelines, particularly in the South, more fracking in Mexico, more offshore drilling in the Gulf. To conclude, what do we need to do? Um, you know, Trump is stuffing the corporate grab bag that is NAFTA with more corporate handouts um, while claiming that he's a trade populist. 
I think it's important that we rail not only against uh, bad trade deals, but rail for a, a new trade vision, uh, bold, progressive, even populist trade vision that we can all support, that would support communities on all sides of our borders. Um, we need this new vision, um, partly just to know what we're going for, but also to use as a yardstick by which to indict Trump. Um, uh, we need to have a very clear uh, uh, standard by which we to judge whatever comes out of the Trump administration so as to cut him down to size and show that his um, uh, NAFTA promises are actually resulting in more corporate handouts uh, of another raw deal for our communities. And so what you personally can do, we will get into more, but I would leave you, leave you with three quick things. One, we need members of Congress to speak out more on this and assert a very bold vision uh, for what should replace NAFTA. Um, so you can help by contacting your member of Congress. And we have an online action, um, and we'll send out the link, um, where you can ask your member of Congress to take a bold stand on a progressive vision for NAFTA's replacement. You can get connected locally. Uh, we need to be talking more with each other, whether it's doing more educational forums, or maybe a member of Congress is having a town hall in your district, um, getting together with others in, in your community to pressure that member of Congress. Uh, we can connect you with others who are taking action in your area. And the third thing is reading up. Uh, we need to, all of us need to get more and more educated on the impacts that NAFTA has had uh, across borders, across sectors, and we have an array of materials uh, available for you. If we do our work now, uh, when Trump and his regressive trade agenda are no longer with us, um, our progressive vision for NAFTA's replacement will be ready to go. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, let's continue to move on. Uh, the next speaker is Cristina Garcia. Uh, she is the uh, mobilization uh, community member mobilization manager with Alianza Americas, uh, and she will be presenting next. Cristina, the floor is yours. Hi, Oscar. Hi, everyone. Can you see my screen yet? Yes, we can. Perfect. Um, well, I'd like to get started just simply by uh, telling you a little bit about who we are and uh, what our mission is. We are a network of organized Latin American and Caribbean immigrant organizations in the United States. We're the only organization in the U.S. that is rooted in Latino immigrant communities, meaning we work directly with migrants through our membership base. Um, and this includes uh, 50 organizations nationwide in the U.S., as well as uh, relationships and partnerships in Latin America, particularly Mexico and Central America. Next, I just wanna go over quickly the goals of NAFTA since we are talking about this. I went back and I did, did a little digging into- Christina, One Hello? suggestion, can you actually put your screen in a screen mode? Oh yes. Thank you. Did a little digging into the 93 report to Congress and it looks like you know they never mentioned anything about workers or about people since the beginning the goal was to improve productivity and standards of living through the free flow of commerce and goods and services um, it was to remove tariffs and basically establish uh, principles designed to protect north american investors uh, from the interference by governments so from the very beginning and this is just offering a little bit of facts around NAFTA when it was signed, um, the implementation. Um, since then, agricultural exports to Canada and Mexico have more than quadrupled, bringing us from 8.9 billion in 93 to 38.6 billion in 15, 2015. Um, to date, the United States doesn't only have one NAFTA, but has 14 free trade agreements with 20 countries, which account to 43% for, for, to, uh, of total US agricultural exports in the world. Um, NAFTA is one of the very oldest um, and most comprehensive, and this is key, the word comprehensive, uh, free trade agreements in US history. It's only second oldest to the Israel in 1985. Here you can see some of the, um, the variations from, from 1990 to 2015 in terms of each uh, of these agricultural um, sectors, fruits and vegetables being the highest. Um, and you can see a gradual uh, increase through the years, but basically bringing us to skyrocketing in 2015. 
Again, I just wanted to reiterate something that Ben already mentioned. I put this in this, this presentation just to remind us about a very particular and uh, special provision that not a lot of people are aware of, which is Ben talked about it in its chapter 11 within NAFTA, which gives corporate, uh, basically corporations, a privilege to have a free reign um, on you know how they administer um, processes and labor agreements in foreign countries. In this sense, it gives them the right to sue local and national governments if they interfere with their profit making. So um, basically, they describe this as any real or potential profits on existing or planned investments. Um, this would obviously, this is really important and it's um, serious because it would obviously infringe on corporations who may want to do the right thing, um, you know, in terms of paying dignified and decent wage to workers, um, you know, or, or, or any other employers who would want to basically go, you know, uh, and, and, and practice good labor practices. Um, it would also put pressure on employers, um, uh, make it hard, making it harder for workers to try to organize a lot uh, along the lines of collective bargaining rights, which I'm sure the next presenter may touch on some more. And basically, uh, allowing corporations to enjoy maximum rights while people do not. And, and again, goods are able to fr uh, freely flow between Mexico and the United States, but people cannot. And this is a recurring theme throughout our presentations because we think it's really important to uh, focus on this aspect. Um, a lot of the, the, I'll go over some of the broken promises that NAFTA, NAFTA basically gave us. And um, just to remind us of what some of these were and how essentially they were broken and what the overall effects have been of these broken promises. In fact, basically one of the main ones was that it was going to bring more jobs to Mexico and the United States. We've seen that um, many of these jobs were in the form of maquilas, which not have not always um, really um, account for, I guess, good jobs or dignified uh, working conditions for people. Um, it said it would create opportunities across all three countries. Didn't quite do that. Um, we're seeing all of the effects of that now. Um, it said that it would help bring Mexico out of poverty. Poverty was just reported at 46.2% uh, for routers on, in 2015. Um, it, it would remove restrictions to trade and everyone would win. Well, it did remove restrictions to trade, but not everyone won. Um, we find that most of those in um, the higher income brackets um, and more enterprise and transnational corporations won while the farmer or the more of the po uh, poor worker did not. Um, it also promised that it would ensure food security and the supply chain over the years. What this has caused is an overproduction of food um, where workers on both sides, especially here in the United States, can't keep up. The cost of export we see is higher than many times the cost of production. And in terms of crops, NAFTA also promised that corn producers, corn being one of the main staples of the Mexican economy, um, that it would, that, that farmers simply would switch to another crop and that they would make ends meet with that. Well, that's not necessarily true because in the practice, um, switching to another crop, anybody um, would need special inputs, they would need technical support, um, and this is really hard to come by if you're a low-income producer that pretty much produces for your own or a local or a local um, to to sell in the local uh, village or economy. It would also uh, it also promised that it would boost incomes in Mexico and increase demand for a greater vo volume and variety of food and feed products from the United States. And the gover the government accountability office said NAFTA would reduce unauthorized Mexican migration to the United States in the long run, which we we have seen it has not. It has actually done quite the opposite of that. Some of the some of the actual effects of NAFTA have actually been displaced the displacement of two million workers from Mexico in 1991 to 2007 mostly uh, small rural farmers were decimated um, with this. And this actually did away with 20, 20 to 25% of the farm labor force in Mexico, depending on which source we're looking at. Um, not, not only was the economic uh, sector 
or way of life, uh, not only was the economics of it uh, decimated, but also the way of life in the sense that this really just um, affected workers or uh, farmers that um, you know be pretty much made their livelihoods around farming and a certain style of life that they you know didn't always agree with um, you know them didn't always take them to have to move but in this case they were had no choice but have you know had to be uprooted. Um, the displacement of workers also causing the separation of families. Many left their homes in search of jobs. Um, basically, this just gave rise to the perpetuating of family destabilization, also being affected or majorly is exacerbated by U.S. immigration policy, which has not um, in any way, shape, or form recognized um, this, this displacement by NAFTA in the sense of allowing workers any kind of regularization of their status. And, and so we still have that problem in the United States and which has led to not the regularization, but the actual criminalization of people living here without a, without a status. Um, other effects that we have seen is the deterioration of health um, due to a lot of uh, the obesity levels in places like Mexico as well as in the US has you know, been basically um, skyrocketed, um, creating an epidemic. Um, a lot of this has caused has been has been due to the fact of the you know a lot of uh, sugary consumption of, of of drinks of processed foods, um, the utilization of corn syrup for example. So we've seen these effects on 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 people in general on, on both sides of the borders. Um, not we we haven't only seen uh, these impacts or. Or, 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 or farmers displays in Mexico, but also in the United States. Um, we've seen that U.S. small farmers have also lost. So not everyone has won according to what uh, was originally proposed. The integration of the agricultural markets basically has led to a decline in the number of farmers. Um, in, from 1992 to 2012, the U.S. lost about 22% of its small-scale farmers. And these are farmers making under $350,000 uh, in, in annual gross income a year. Um, the U.S. also lost about 5% of its mid-sized farmers, those who were making about $1 million a year. Um, and what we saw was that only large farms have increased, and they've increased dramatically by 107%, um, basically benefiting large agribusiness and, uh, and the like. Well, what do we need to do? Or let me see. Yeah, but basically there's a lot to be said about small scale farmers not being able to compete with large agribusiness. Um, you know, these are economies of scale that use advanced technologies to, to basically farm their fields. And um, you know, there's no way that uh, smaller scale or mid-sized farmers um, can compete with these. And then the demand for production or high yields has just been so, so high, there has never really been any assistance in terms of you know, looking at this disparity between um, farmers um, or, or the low producing farmers versus the higher. Um, this has also given way to the implementation of more maquilas. Um, maquilas have already been have already been there since before and after, but this basically has exacerbated um, where maquila work has increased, replaced farm practices a lot. This means long hours for workers. Um, this means um, that a lot of these transnational companies can ignore worker protections. They don't have to uh, abide by any labor standards or choose not to. Um, and it's really hard for, for workers, um, especially women or people who are in vulnerable situations, to be able to voice their demands um, because a lot of times they risk uh, retaliation or simply being fired and losing their, their jobs. So what do we need to do to, to, um, to push back on this? Um, one of the main things that as Alianza Americas we see is that the role of organized migrants in, this, in these struggles is critical. We need to prioritize um, workers and immigrants, men, women, and 
different uh, in, popula in affected populations to be part of these conversations. We need more transparency. Um, we need to be sure that these, com as Ben said, um, that organizations like ours who are presenters on this panel, on this panel today, are actually sitting at the decision-making table. Now that we know what NAFTA, the effects of NAFTA, we don't want to reproduce that. And we need, we also need approaches to trade that put working people first. Um, we've seen such a vast displacement and the negative impacts um, being on people, especially poor rural farmers, both on both sides of our border. So we need to make sure that this new approach to trade puts people at the center. And for that, um, we need to make sure that, that our communities are sitting there and on our understanding what is happening. Because this has to this impacts their lives directly. Um, another reason that we chose to um, come together on this subject is that we really need to take a cross-sector approach to how we think about these issues. They're all, all interrelated. Um, the culprit being trade, and so we thought that partnering with these two great organizations was one, one a critical step in making this happen. And we hope that you will also join this conversation um, in the in the short term. Another thing we really need to be uh, more conscious and paying more attention to is foreign policy issues. Uh, we need to create an, a, a, a loud, louder voice or platform whereby we can actually impact foreign policy issues so that we help put pressure on decision makers. Um, so I would leave it right there. I think I'm getting the time cut. So um, that's pretty much it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christina. And um, last but not least uh, comes uh, Hector Sanchez from LACLA and the National Hispanic Leadership Agenda. Floor is yours, Hector. Thank you, everybody, and thank you to you, Oscar, for convening this, and Ben and Christina for the great overview of those slides. It's, uh, it's very important information. Uh, uh, as an organization here in LACLA, we have been working on these issues for, for literally over 20 years, really looking at the history of this critical issue and the impact it has had on workers. The Labor Council for Latin American Advancement is a, a, a Latino organization that focuses on, on protecting workers' rights and immigrant rights and, and advancing the agenda of Latino workers in the nation and immigrant workers in the nation. And if there is something that we can say about NAFTA is that when it comes to workers, when it comes to immigration, it was a big failure. The analysis from other perspectives can be different, but from our priorities on those two issues, it was devastating for workers here, and it was devastating for workers there. And today I want to also touch on, on, on the correlation between the conversation that we're having today on all the issues of immigration and make the connection to trade. Um, I also don't want to be very repetitive of some of the issues that were already discussed, but I may have to touch briefly on some of those uh, issues. First of all, times of challenges represent times of opportunities. And even though as a nation we're facing unique challenges, especially after the election of this president and his anti-worker agenda, I also believe that the fact that we are discussing NAFTA, we need to take this opportunity to organize and mobilize to make sure that this time workers and workers' representatives have a seat at the table. Because it is 100% uh, true what Ben said. These are treaties for corporations and uh, the labor voices, the priorities of workers have pretty much been uh, missed in, in all of these negotiations. So this is an opportunity for, for us to make sure that we put as much pressure as possible and learn from more than two decades on what worked and what didn't work. So from that perspective, we need to recognize that we are asymmetric nations. When NAFTA was negotiated, um, in Mexico was almost 25% an agricultural nation, 25% of, of, of people in the nation were directly correlated to farms and, 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 and 
in, in the different spaces that are independent of farms, while the U.S. it was almost two to three uh, percent during those uh, years. Based on uh, the NAFTA negotiations, Mexico touched tariffs, cut tariffs in agricultural and livestock products and all the manufactured goods from the U.S. But something that was very critical and that had a very serious impact in Mexican farmers was the cut to subsidies on corn, which it was negotiated under NAFTA. And on the other hand, in the U.S., obviously, we have some of the highest subsidies in the entire world for some of these industries. So what happened? A Mexican farmers couldn't compete anymore. So they had to buy corn from the U.S. that was 30% cheap or, or more in some cases at the time. So their, uh, their jobs were devastated and they either had to move to the cities uh, if there were some more jobs, but there were no more cre job creation for a lot of these farmers or migrate to the United States as it was already discussed. This is very important to put it in that perspective because this opportunity to discuss NAFTA and to discuss immigration and see the correlation that we have in both cases is very, very important. We must stop as a nation, as the United States, being a hypocritical nation and stop blaming Mexico and stop blaming immigrants for a lot of the things that are happening in our country. It is time to still be, uh, start being honest with a lot of the different issues and the root causes of this problem. We created, the United States created a perfect system for exploitation of undocumented immigrant workers and the negotiations with NAFTA and NAFTA are directly correlated to that perfect system. Because in on the one hand, with the implementation of NAFTA, we push farmers out of, uh, out of their land. And in the other hand, we have entire sectors of the economy in the United States that are fully dependent of the labor and the work of those undocumented workers. Sectors like agriculture, construction, manufacturing, services, in other uh, sectors that have 20, 25 percent, some of them have more undocumented workers than the, the workers they employ, uh, uh, U.S. workers over here. But it's a perfect system of exploitation. Having 11 million undocumented workers in the most powerful nation in the world is not a mistake. It is public policy. And we need to start uh, recognizing a lot of these issues and if we need these workers we need elements to recognize these workers to legalize these workers and to embrace these workers in the nation because what we're doing right now as a nation either through free trade agreements or to um, immigration policies that only make a uh, worker just more vulnerable is creating a system of exploitation for undocumented workers in which all of their labor rights, their human rights, and their uh, civil rights are constantly violated. And there is no system of integration of these workers. So when we're talking about the renegotiation of NAFTA, when we're talking about who's going to be sitting in this table of negotiations, we need to make sure that workers are also having a space in these uh, tables. Now, but this is about workers in Mexico, it's about workers here, and it's about immigrant workers. This is a good time to take a step back and recognize what are the needs that we have as a nation? What are the needs that we have uh, as an economy? And what do we need from undocumented workers? What are, what are the needs that we have of having these 11 million workers in the nation? We have been saying as an organization that we must have immigration reform because if all the studies show that we need these workers, the economy needs these workers, we need to make sure that there is a path to legalization for these fantastic workers and these people that contribute so much to our society. Now, another thing that um, created some problems for, um, for workers is NAFTA pits workers against each other and increase the vulnerability of workers. This is very important, and I, I will uh, think that the reason why we have Trump 
it's in part because of a lot of the messaging of workers against workers and how Trump manipulated the message on NAFTA to take advantage of, of that populism. Uh, how do we explain that somebody has never care about workers and we know that in labor we know that Trump never ever care about workers he never wanted to negotiate uh, uh, with workers in his hotels he always made sure that he wanted to oppose all the labor rights in those uh, different spaces we know all the uh, what he did with all the contractors in his hotels so how do we explain that somebody with that background suddenly cares about a uh, NAFTA and, and, and the rights of workers. So it's very important to make sure that we analyze that from the perspective of what is the best for workers' rights in all the different countries. We know that NAFTA was bad for workers over there. It was bad for workers here in the United States, and it was bad for workers in Canada. And we just have to look at the economic indicators of the three different nations in the concentration of wealth. For Mexico, after NAFTA, it opened the doors for the biggest concentration of wealth that we have seen in the history of humanity, how do we explain that Mexico, that has almost 50% of poverty, now or at some point had the richest person in the world with almost 7% of the GDP of the nation? And we can mention 10 different families from Mexico that literally control uh, a lot of the wealth in the nation while we see a lot of poverty in the nation. So, no. The promises of NAFTA at the beginning saying Mexico in 10 years is going to be a first world nation didn't happen. What happened is the concentration of wealth uh, drastically increased in a lot of the workers' issues that we saw before uh, we got into NAFTA are still present in Mexico. What happened in the United States? A lot of the mobilizations that we have seen uh, lately, uh, especially since the Great Depression and even before, are directly related to the concentration of wealth in, in the nation, where the 1% and all the, uh, uh, the conversations that we have been having around the 1% are directly related to these trade policies, in which a few people really got most of the benefits directly correlated to those uh, corporations. But most of the people uh, didn't win from those things. Anybody that is familiar with the fight that we had on the minimum wage is directly um, um, affected by all of these issues because while the concentration of wealth keeps increasing, the wages are stagnated. While the productivity of workers keeps in, keep increasing, uh, workers are not really uh, seeing any of the benefits of all the uh, uh, the wins that the corporations have had through the history and through the negotiation of all these different issues. So we need to be very careful not to put workers against each other. And as we move forward, we need to make sure that we don't put Latino, uh, African-American workers, white workers, Asian American workers against each other in manipulating those messages. All of these elements are workers' rights issues. And we need to make sure that those are the different perspectives that we, uh, that we come from. Um, I'm just looking at the phone. It seems like um, my time is off. But just to, just to conclude, um, some of the recommendations that, that we have as organizations are the revision of NAFTA with a very, very solid um, um, workers' voices at the table. That's a top priority for us. And I think we're on the same line with most of the progressive voices in the nation. If NAFTA is going to be renegotiated, it has to be about the workers. We don't want to go globalization of the worst things that we, wanna, uh, that we have. We don't want a globalization of exploitation of workers. What we want is globalization of the middle class, globalization of protections for workers, globalization of a good minimum wage globalization of the different workers' priorities that we accomplish in the labor movement through the different years. We want immigration reform. It's time to have immigration reform. With all this anti-immigrant movement that we have seen in the nation, is enough. We need these workers, and all the stories show that. Let's stop being a hypocritical nation and let's embrace the workers that we need through a legalization process. There is no line right now to embrace these workers that are feeding us, that are building our roads. If we really 
eh, or what I can say for those eh, anti-immigrant voices eh, that are attacking immigrants, do something about it. Uh, boycott, boycott any vegetable that has been eh, grown with immigrant hands. Boycott buying houses that have been built with immigrant hands. Boycott driving in roads that have been built with immigrant hands. And then we will understand why this work is so important for the contributing to our economy. And finally, we need more protections for workers um, in the three nations. Again, unionization is one of the key elements that we have in collective bargaining to protect workers. And I'm going to stop right there because I ran out of time and I want to make sure that all of us get some of the questions. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Hector. Um, while Amy Shannon, one of my co-workers in Alianza Americas, um, manages to actually summarize the questions that have been asked, uh, a couple of them actually came through the chat uh, function uh, and some others through the Q&A. Uh, let me just uh, take advantage of my role as a moderator to also point out uh, the fact that clearly, I don't think any one of us necessarily would argue that NAFTA is the only reason why the world has evolved in the way it has, particularly when it comes to the sad reality of wealth and income inequality pretty much around the world or most countries that have embraced the kind of economic policy recipes that have emanated uh, not only from the U.S. but from institutions that are largely controlled either by the U.S. or the European Union. I'm talking about the World Trade Organization, the International Monetary Fund, and others. Uh, and clearly, we are also pointing out uh, that we need to tackle not only what's wrong you know, with these particular systems that have been created, such as the trade agreement architecture, but we also need to address uh, serious vacuums that exist today if we are indeed to recommit uh, the, the very uh, activities that we all engage in to the goal of ensuring a quality way of life for most people, whether they happen to be in a country like Mexico, Canada, or for that matter, the US. Uh, and the last thing I want to say before going into the questions is that very often, the debate gets to be framed in manners that are more intended to divide communities and divide peoples rather than bring us together. For example, there is a lot of talk about the so-called U.S. trade deficit or U.S. trade surplus could be at times. Uh, the reality is that from a global elite point of view, uh, questions of surplus or deficit when it comes to trade measure on a national basis, uh, it's really a non-conversation because it's not important at all. I mean, they care more than anything else, first and foremost, about profits. And profits don't really relate, you know, to the question of uh, surpluses or deficits when it comes to trade. Uh, they speak more about the fact that the elite, the economic elite that now pretty much controls most of the world, uh, has managed to keep us debating the wrong questions, uh, such as the question of surpluses or deficits when it comes to trade, when in reality we should be looking at global standards that ensure that people have indeed a chance to enjoy a decent way of life again in the country they were born, uh, because that's what we all would choose if we had a chance. Uh, but any country, you know, where we happen to be, where we also need to globalize uh, access to rights and the exercise of rights uh, irrespective to immigration status, uh, for example. So let me uh, ask Amy if there is a way to summarize questions or if there were very pointed questions or specifically directed questions uh, that you may want to just remind the panelists, I think we all were able to see what questions came through, but Amy, I'd like to give you the opportunity to perhaps summarize some of the questions. Sure, Oscar, thank you. Um, th we've had several uh, questions related to wealth and poverty. Um, uh, someone, uh, Francisco Ferreira, asked about wealth inequality, who owns the money, uh, 
Uh, what do we need uh, in terms of global workers' movements to challenge um, that? And someone uh, earlier in the, t um, actually, I believe it was the same questioner asked about whether or not we're able to um, say anything about the poverty levels, uh, the stubborn um, poverty levels sticking at 46% in Mexico. So uh, if there's any way to correlate that with NAFTA. Um, so those were a couple. There were also, um, uh, Elena Olea asked if there are specific opportunities for workers' voices to be heard during the negotiation process, if there's any way to break through uh, this secrecy, I believe that Ben mentioned in his um, presentation, or, or what sectors will be re represented in the renegotiation pr uh, process, and how can we um, democratize that process. Um, uh, uh, someone asked about the reluctance to um, frame the forced migration or um, survival migration as, as, as Harriet Haywood described it, um, it as something that we people are being have been reluctant to link to US trade, economic, and militaristic policies, and how can we make those connections uh, more explicit so that we could put pressure on policymakers? And um, finally, someone asked a very specific question about whether NAFTA had any relationship to release a recent failed vote to unionize an auto manufacturing plant in Mississippi. People are continuing to ask questions, so we may do a second round. Well, I would like to ask the uh, panelists to actually tackle uh, any question that you would like uh, re related to what Amy just summarized. Uh, I just saw another question come through, but let's, let's see if we can deal with the first set of issues that Amy just summarized uh, for us. And I don't know, Ben, would you like to take a first uh, shot at answering to some of these questions? Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, to get at the, I mean, it's a really interesting question about how do you, the conversation about immigration, the conversation about trade in, our, in the U.S. Congress are seen as two separate conversations, which as all of us have just talked about, uh, is not actually the evidence that we've seen over the course of more than two decades uh, where uh, NAFTA contributed to, it wasn't certainly the only contributor, it contributed to forced migration uh, out of Mexico by displacing uh, literally millions of people. Um, and by encouraging a race to the bottom in, in labor and environmental standards, um, et cetera. And so, you know, I think it's one, and actually to kind of address the poverty question, I think, you know, Christina mentioned several of the statistics. Um, you can just look up the World Bank data for um, extreme poverty uh, in Mexico. In the first three years of NAFTA, extreme poverty actually spread to uh, more than half of the rural population of, of Mexico um, as uh, farmers, in, including corn farmers and agricultural workers, uh, lost not just their jobs, but their livelihoods, had to sell their land uh, and look for something else to do, many of them migrating, as uh, Hector mentioned, to cities or, or to the United States. Um, how do you frame this? How do you get members of Congress to care and to actually connect these dots that are, uh, it's not just a narrative connection, it's a factual connection that trade, any trade model that allows corporations to cross borders in a race to the bottom, that allows corporations to dump subsidized corn, um, uh, for example, in, under NAFTA, um, will have a bearing on, on immigration. And insofar as people are not allowed to cross borders, it will have a bearing on undocumented immigration. Um, that, I think, is something that we've grappled with, and I, I think there's a, a panoply of answers that could be offered. One that we, a frame that we often talk about, depends on who you're talking to, but some members of Congress who actually do care about uh, um, the separation of families, who do oppose um, Trump's xenophobic approach to immigration, and who believe that we should not be engaging in mass deportations. Um, I would say to them, and I have said to them, you know, that we believe that no one should be forced from home. Do you believe that no one should be forced from home, as in a mother in Arizona should not be forced to, to say goodbye to her daughter and her son um, because ICE is knocking at her door? Shouldn't you also believe that a farmer in Mexico uh, should not be forced from home because of an unfair trade deal? 
it's the same essential principle saying that, um, you know, migration should be a, an, an opportunity, it should be a, 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 a choice, um, not something that is compelled, not something that is forced. And so no one should be forced uh, to leave the place that they live. I think it's something we can all identify with. None of us wants to be torn away from our family, from our community. Um, and yet both ICE and NAFTA have done exactly that. And so that's one way uh, I would suggest to certain members of Congress, uh, certainly not the xenophobic ones, but to certain members of Congress, a way to connect those dots. Um, no one should be forced from home. Um, and then just to address the transparency question, I mean, we have no indication that the Trump administration uh, intends to uh, provide an, uh, any, uh, an increased degree of transparency from the baseline of no transparency that we saw in the negotiation of NAFTA itself and the negotiation of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, once again, uh, corporations are in the room, have privileged access to texts and negotiators, while most of the rest of us are, are locked out. Um, this last week, actually, in the first round of negotiations, the Trump administration actually eliminated even the minimal level of stakeholder engagement that was present in past rounds of negotiations. So it looks like the Trump administration in negotiating NAFTA 2.0 is replicating the same degree of secrecy that produced that corporate deal in the first place. Um, can I? Christina or uh, Hector, if you want to follow. I just wanted to add um, that, you know, just to piggyback off of what Ben said, another promise of NAFTA was that it was going to help, going to help Mexico, uh, you know, lift it out and bring it into prosperity. And what we've seen is that the, you know, the, 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 the GDP has actually stagnated for them. So, you know, these are just indicators again. I mean, there's nothing like the testimonies and the real life experiences of the people and just the waves and waves of economic migrants from Mexico who have been displaced, not only to the United States, but also to cities. But so there's, you know, there's all these indicators and the data that, you know, we have as, as proof of what, what occurred. Um, but I think that, you know, we really need to figure out with ourselves as an advocates and stakeholders who are caring about these issues and working on this. And, um, you know, for us, it's really important to stop working out of silos. And so, um, you know, when we were approached about, you know, collaborating on this, um, it was it was great because we think, you know, that there's enough people that out there that care about the issues, but for some reason or another, we haven't been sitting down across from each other talking about where are our points of influence, where can we make a difference, um, et cetera. So one of the other things that I will say is that, you know, Trump's discourse um, has largely been around pitying the U.S. worker against the immigrant worker. Um, we have the tools at our disposal and we have the facts to counter that narrative. That's a narrative that has really hurt um, everyone. Um, so at this point, not only immigrants, but just everyone. Um, the way the state of the of, of the state of the nation, and, and I guess we can we can we can call it. Um, and so it's important that we arm ourselves with the knowledge to really be able to dispel all of these falsehoods around, you know, statements like they're taking our jobs. And I put that out on the table um, because a lot of times, you know, that's something like the pink elephant that in the room that no one wants to talk about, but everybody's thinking or is somehow misinformed or is just believing everything they hear on the airwaves. And so how can we begin to make inroads into those conversations um, by putting out, you know, <laughs> real, real, not only the facts, but, you know, real accounts of people. Um, and I'll take this opportunity and I'll hopefully Oscar will give me a minute at the end to, to, to do a little pitch about our Alianza America speaking and listening tours, but we're getting ready to um, go into the Midwest, specifically Michigan and Wisconsin, um, to talk to see and have um, discussions with a variety of stakeholders around the, the issue of, of jobs and workers and the economy. So um, those dates are September 19 through the 26th. We'll be in the Midwest again. And so if you do want more information, um, we'll share that. We'll share more of that with you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Hector, anything you want to add? Yeah, let me just touch a little bit on the issue of putting workers against workers, particularly uh, pitting uh, workers from here against immigrant workers. As an organization, I have been, I have had the opportunity and the honor to travel all over the nation to witness 
the condition of a lot of these workers that we're talking about. No one should be working in those conditions. Uh, I have seen in North Carolina a trailer uh, chicken houses with seven families living in it, infested with insects and children playing there. Those are the houses in which the farm workers are housed by their employers. I have known and we have been involved in workers dying in the fields because they cannot take a water break. We know of the drastic increase in sexual harassment and rape in the workplace are or undocumented sisters. We know that undocumented workers have the highest levels of death and injuries at work, the highest levels of wage theft, and a drastic increase on constant violation of their uh, labor rights and, and human rights. So when we're talking about these jobs and the jobs that these immigrants are taking away in our nation, in the nation that we claim is the most advanced nation in the world, nobody should be doing those jobs. Jobs that have no basic labor rights, jobs that are constantly violating the human rights of workers, and jobs that uh, should not exist. Those are not the kind of jobs that we need to be creating in the nation. Nobody should be taking those jobs. I don't want those jobs for African Americans. I don't want those jobs for Native Americans. I don't want those jobs for Latinos. I don't want those jobs for white workers. Nobody should be having jobs that do not offer the basic uh, elements of protections for workers' rights. So I just wanted to touch on that uh, uh, a little bit. The second part is uh, somebody asked about what can we do. And I honestly believe, and I've been working on on labor rights and with the labor movement for over a decade. But I also been very involved with the immigrant rights movement and with the Latino, uh, the Latino organizations and the different spaces. We have also been doing some work with the environmental groups. I honestly believe that the more coordination among progressive groups that we can have to push common agendas forward, the better. I remember some time ago, the different spaces we're working in silos and, and in the different mobilizations. I think we're doing much better. I think this call is one example of that, to have the environmental movement, to have the immigrant rights movement, and to have labor coming together with common priorities. I think it's an important thing. And from my perspective, um, I feel that one of the key answers is to organize about, around labor. Uh, labor has been under a huge attack since the Reagan years, and I think that's also directly correlated with uh, a lot of the corporations trying to weaken uh, labor in Mexico, in Canada, and, and literally all over the world. Uh, historically, we know that labor has been a key element to win the most important battles for workers in the world. And uh, if we bring those values to the table of negotiation and we mobilize around those values, I think we can have better agreements with our neighboring nations. Thank you, Hector. I mean, there are a few other questions, Amy, do you want to quickly summarize them? Sure, um, I can just, uh, there's a one question um, has to do with kind of how we should be what what's the sequencing of what we should be doing now um, that to, to sort of uh, respond to the question of well let's see what Trump does or give Trump a, a chance and see what they produce so what is the, the question is what sh, what sh, how can we justify or what should what should be our steps now to shape the political environment to um, influence those negotiations. Um, another questioner, Mary Levine, asked whether or not, um, sort of specifically asked what labor is doing and whether or not the, um, there's a, a programs to get rank and file members of unions to be able to connect those dots between immigration and trade. And if labor, if you know, if the if we don't think labor unions have done enough about this, how can we address that? Um, someone else asked about corruption um, and, and um, sort of what the, what is the role of corruption in all of this and how is it that um, people can become more engaged in uh, pointing out the problems and avoiding the kinds of exploitation that people were talking about. There was one other question that I just wanted to bring up because I think it's very important as well. 
and it was posed by Maria Canchola, uh, I believe from Mexico. And she was basically asking, how can we change the mind, the interest, and the priorities you know, of enterprises, governments, I would add people, um, so that you know, we stop being so incredibly one-sided, uh, committed to serving the interest of corporation and not of ordinary people, citizens in their respective nations. So I think that that's a very profound question that also uh, should get some sort of an answer from our panelists. So I'd like to again ask Ben, Christina, and, and um, Hector. And perhaps, I mean, after those uh, answers are uh, done, uh, we will probably be moving to bringing this uh, webinar to a close. So, Ben. Sure. Um, okay, so to combine a couple of the questions on, you know, what should we be doing now? Um, and, and also kind of similarly, how can we be convincing, uh, government officials, uh, that, uh, they should not be, you know, just prioritizing the narrow interests of corporations, um, uh, above people and, and planet. Um, I think what we should be doing now, um, is, uh, is putting out a very bold, um, boldly what we actually stand for. Um, as I mentioned, I think we need to be stating very clearly, um, what we want. Uh, out of NAFTA's replacement. We don't, we're not a fan of NAFTA. I mean, all of us uh, have been saying we, we dislike NAFTA and for all the reasons that we've mentioned on this call for more than 20 years. But we've also been saying for about the same amount of time, here's what we do want. Here are some specific objectives that we would have in a trade deal that replaces NAFTA. We're not against the idea of trade deals. Uh, we're against deals that prioritize uh, corporations' profits uh, over really everything else. Um, and so, you know, when it, just in the last uh, nine months, um, when NAFTA renegotiations started to be a thing, uh, we saw um, a, a env leading environmental groups put out, here's eight things that we need to have out of any deal that replaces NAFTA. Uh, the AFL-CIO put out a list of six things that must be uh, included. Um, family farmers from in, in all three nations put out said, here's a list of things that we want to see out of any NAFTA replacement. Consumer groups did the same. And these things largely cohere with each other and they form uh, a package that is basically a progressive vision for what should replace NAFTA. Uh, and it's a package that is, I'd say, diametrically opposed in, in many respects to uh, the polluter-friendly and xenophobic agenda that uh, a number of times Trump uh, and his administration has espoused uh, for NAFTA 2.0. Um, so what do we do? I think we need to stand uh, more, uh, be louder, uh, actually, and, and more united, as, as uh, Hector suggested, in putting out this um, package of what we want to see, our vision, for, uh, for trade and our vision for NAFTA's replacement. Um, why do we need to do that? Because it, we need something by which to assess what comes out of the Trump administration. Um, we need uh, to have a yardstick uh, by which to say, you know, Trump promised that he was going to give support workers in, in these trade deals. Well, look at this provision that uh, he's contemplating that would actually pit workers against each other. Um, instead, we need this other uh, binding floor of labor standards that would uh, allow uh, support workers in all countries in their efforts to organize. Um, we need to be able to uh, assert uh, that, that standard um, to indict Trump. And I, and I would not say that we would uh, want to wait and see until to what the Trump administration produces. Just like when our domestic legislation, our domestic bills are being negotiated, uh, we don't just sit quietly and wait and see what they come up with. I mean, when health care was on the table, when the repeal and replace Obamacare and then just was simply repeal Obamacare, we didn't just sit and wait to see what they were contemplating. We, uh, you know, made very clear, don't do anything that's going to cast millions of people um, out, off of health insurance. Um, do not do anything that would jeopardize public health. Uh, instead, we need to uh, ensure a provision of, of health care for all. And Similarly, with, uh, with trade deals, since trade deals essentially are binding rules on our daily lives, much like domestic legislation is, we cannot afford to wait and see. We need to be out there now saying, here is the standard. Um, and so I think a lot of the, uh, what that requires is going to our members of Congress now and getting them to raise their voices. Um, and I think uh, you know, the way that you do that is by uh, making clear that um, you're not just speaking on your own individual behalf, you're speaking for literally a movement of millions. The movement that defeated the TPP uh, was labor, environmentalists, internet rights activists, public health 
communities of faith in across borders, across sectors, and across party lines. So I think to my, a message to member of Congress is, you, if you'd like to keep your job, uh, it's important that you stand for a progressive uh, stance on, on NAFTA. It was pretty clear in last year's election, you could not be pro-TPP and win that election. Um, and in next year's election, we're going to be asking, where do you stand on NAFTA? Um, so even if you don't believe it, uh, even if uh, a member of Congress says, well, they don't have a lot of thoughts on trade, you need to have thoughts on trade uh, because this is going to be a critical issue for your job retention. Um, and just to uh, you know conclude, I think, and the other reason that we can, it's important to be talking about what our vision is for NAFTA's replacement is because of what Cristina, Oscar, and Hector Val mentioned, um, that it can bring us together. We, uh, you know, had a movement building workshop in Detroit a couple weeks back where we got into the room immigrant rights activists, uh, unionists, including some who voted for Trump, uh, and Sierra Club volunteers, uh, local communities of color fighting incinerators, these groups don't always agree with each other, and at sometimes they don't trust each other, but they can all agree that they hate NAFTA. And so that it provides a baseline for building of some common cause. And through the course of a two-day workshop, we were able to use the question of what would you have replaced NAFTA? What model would you stand for as a unifying question? Um, at the end of those two days, people were more interested. It wasn't like everyone was seeing Kumbaya, but they were more interested in working with each other. There was a common cause built. Um, and I think that is essential um, so that we can break down the silos that divide us right now um, so that when Trump and his agenda is no longer there, we not only have the content of a new uh, vision to replace NAFTA, but a, a, a powerful movement uh, to be able to support it and put it into place. Cristina or Hector, anything you want to add? Um, Remember to unmute yourself. I can quickly just add, Oscar, that everything that Ben just discussed, we agree, as well as um, we actually are, um, by way of our next um, uh, speaker, speaker um, tour, which will take place again September 19th, through the 26th, we are actively engaging in these kinds of conversations. So this, um, you know, for, for, for any of our uh, guests on the line who would want to host a small dialogue, or a stakeholder cross-sector conversation, um, if you work with a community that is affected, or if you don't, if you're just, if you're an advocate and you, um, you know, want to bring these kinds of conversations to your, to your city, um, we will likely um, go through the cities of Detroit, Grand Rapids, perhaps Kalamazoo, and, and those areas. So, um, and, and then we'll be in Milwaukee, Wisconsin as well. So, um, you know, again, it, it, you know, these, are, these might seem like issues that are very hard to tackle, um, but they're really, we need to make them simpler. We need to bring them to ordinary folks um, to basically show how these these issues are all connected and how um, we can address them from a more people-centered approach. So um, I am going to leave that information with you or um, put it up on my screen, um, or I'll, I'll actually share the link to our website showing some of that information. But um, for folks who did not get a chance to um, register and provide their contact information, um, we have provided a link on the chat box. Um, so please go ahead and fill that out so that we can have it, build it into our um, contact list and make sure that we keep you in the loop. Um, and so I think, um, I think, you know, just building allies, we can't stress that enough. Um, building unlikely allies, um, and, and, and it, it's not always gonna be, it's, it's actually gonna be from, from the bottom up where, uh, where we're going and engaging directly with communities and, um, and, you know, and then, and then we're, we're, we're building on each other's work. So I think that we have an opportunity here to change, um, especially after we've seen the, all the after effects of what trade deals like NAFTA have caused. Um, and so I think it's up to us to really um, make this our issue. Hector? Yeah, just quickly, uh, a couple of final comments. Um, as a nation, we're living some very interesting, but also dangerous 
situation. We need to be uh, united, we need to be a smart, we need to be uh, uh, ready to resist a lot of the changes, negative changes that are happening in the nation. And I think somebody asked, what can we do as uh, from the labor perspective? I believe organize, organize, and organize. Um, that's the perspective that we have in LACLA. Uh, we believe that that's the solution, constantly engaging our base and workers all over the nation on these important issues and increase the mobilization at a time when we're facing so many attacks on collective bargaining, on workers' rights, etc. Some of the campaigns that we have over here at LACLA are, um, we believe that at a time when we are facing challenges and attacks from so many different perspectives, civic participation is a key element to resist and defend our communities and organize. Civic participation means many things, but everything that is related to the democratic process. We do a lot of voter registration all over the nation. We fight all of the voter suppression efforts that we have seen. We build voter education. We do citizenship drives, making sure that we engage all the people that can become citizens to become citizens and engage in the process. Um, we do, um, um, we have been partnering, as I mentioned, with environmental groups, and we had a campaign on farm workers and pesticides. Uh, our farm workers and their children have been poisoned for a number of uh, decades. And um, we have been really engaged in pushing against those issues. And we have been creating partnership with other communities, particularly with our African-American brothers and sisters. Uh, we have campaigns working on workers' rights. We, fa we face a lot of the same challenges uh, when it comes to uh, workers' rights issues. But also in the criminal justice system, it's very unfair for, for our uh, uh, workers and families. So. We do a lot of those campaigns. We have a Trabajadoras campaign. I want to invite everybody on November 2nd is Latina Equal Pay Day. We're going to have a national summit on November 2nd. Everybody's invited. And when it comes to trade, I think trade is one of the elements that it can bring all these different spaces together. And it's a unique opportunity to organize and make sure that we have a better nation, a nation that has a stronger middle class, which is what defines us as a powerful uh, developed nation. I want to thank uh, Christina, uh, Ben, and, and obviously you, Oscar, for convening this important conversation. Muchas gracias. No, thank you all. And uh, with this, I mean, we are pretty much getting ready to come to a close. I uh, just wanted to uh, thank again each one of the panelists, Ben, Christina, Hector, uh, for sharing your experiences, your wisdom, your perspectives. And clearly, the idea is not necessarily to exhaust this item, which is obviously expansive, and not or either to come up with uh, recipes uh, that are just readily available to be deployed. But I think that what's clear, just in terms of the questions that were asked, is that there is clearly much more that we all need to do. And one key message, not only from the panelists, but also from those of you who ask questions, is that we need to find ways to work more closely together across uh, sectors so that we can go beyond just uh, challenging uh, particular policies, whether they happen to be trade policies uh, or economic policies, broadly speaking, uh, but that we need to do so uh, together uh, because clearly this is an issue that should unite us uh, and we should not be playing just defense. We should also be able to uh, speak clearly about what would the world uh, look like if people like us with the values we embrace were actually uh, having a preferential seat in the negotiating table of trade agreements and many other global uh, agreements that are often crafted without those affected being part of the conversation. And as many wise people have said before, if you are not actively participating in deciding what's going to be cooked, chances are you are just going to be one item in the menu to be eaten. So with that, I'd like to thank those of you who participated in this um, uh, webinar. We will be sharing uh, a lot of information uh, with you all uh, posterior to this uh, webinar, um, not only with those of you who attended, but those who also registered and for one reason or another were not able to attend. 
So again, on behalf of the Sierra Club, uh, the Labor Council uh, for Latin Americans Advancement and Alianza America, thank you for participating and we look forward to having you again in one other event joined, uh, jointly organized or separately organized by these and other organizations. Have a good afternoon and I hope you found this useful. Take care.